touch anything. Uh, there are things that you think you can touch, and if you touch them and your fingerprints get on them, then things won't work. So it doesn't matter how cool it looks, please don't touch anything unless you told it. And we, we say this and we mean it, and it's going to save you a lot of misery later on. Um, so I'm not being mean, I'm just being effective. All right, I'm going to, I guess we got a couple more minutes. Do you know if there's a person missing from either of the two groups? You might not know who's exactly in your room. Derek Hart is missing. We should kill him. Um, I'm going to borrow your pen if I can. So let's see. Yeah, uh, what two groups are you? Your group what and what? Uh, a and J. A and J. All right, so let me go through this. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Is that even close to right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Zachary Barton? Yep. Hayden Blair? Here. Uh, Rachel Gregg? Here. Hannah Grover? Here. Jared? Right. Poplar? Poplar, sorry. Uh, and Joshua McNeely? Here. And then, so all of A is here, and then J. Uh, William Runnell? Here. Uh, Connor Natsky? Here. Did I say that right? Close enough. When, when does it tell me? Natsky. Natsky. Oh. That was pretty close. Uh, Brittany Flo. Here. Um, Allison is here. Uh, Derek Hart is not here. Big Slur Baker? Here. Uh, Andrew Bales? Here. Larissa Lucan. Lucan. I try and I fail. Okay. Um, uh, can you count these and make sure there's uh, 15 of them there at least? I'm not handing them out right now, but I just, this is a bigger group than I was anticipating. Optics, get in here. <laughs> That's your seat. And you are Derek Hart. Are you? A blue like a red. Blue. Blue, sweet. Blue's a good color. The color of the sky. <laughs> Black or red? Black? Black. We're pretty assertive about that. <laughs> Okay, so if you flip to the very first page of these notebooks, each of you should take one. Please don't write in these. We do use them from one section to the next. Uh, these notebooks contain, first of all, on the front page, a little syllabus of uh, what we're going to be doing. Oh, wait a minute. We have another person. You're not on the list. No, I was moved sections. Section A. You were moved to section A? Yeah. What's your last name? Lawrence. Oh my god, and since this is not in alphabetical order, <laughs> what section were you in? B. Oh yeah, okay. Um, okay. Crap. Greco, run to the office, check in my mailbox, and see if there's another yellow folder in there. There should be a kid should have left one in there. Um, Jackie, you're going to join that group over there. Wow, 16. We're going big. This is, going to be mad. this is about as bad as it gets. Okay. It's going to be so, mad. You're, you're right in so, the shot. Yeah, and she might, is there another stool in there? she might need another stool, and you might have to actually steal that. Does anyone see another stool in the room? It's not being used. Okay, you might have to run up and steal one from the electronics room, Steve's old room. If there's not, you can also check next door, right. but but we have to have everybody else. Anyway, okay, so uh, Jackie, we'll get you a stool in just a minute. Um, but uh, so we're 
Uh, very quickly looking at the front page of this thing, and I'll, we'll get you a notebook too. Uh, so we're going to be doing uh, four days of, of material, and each of those first four days uh, we'll start with a lecture. Today will by far be the longest of the four lectures. And then uh, so morning is sort of lecture, and then late morning and for the rest of the afternoon you'll be basically doing activities, putting assembling various optical devices. Uh, We'll have a little problem set after the lecture this morning, um, but that'll be a one-off thing. We'll only do that on the first day. Uh, at the end of the fourth day, I will hand out a set of uh, projects for you to select from, and you will brainstorm with your group uh, about uh, what project you want to do and then how to address a particular project. And then the fifth day, you'll spend that whole day uh, designing that project, assembling it, testing it, making sure it works. And, and then at the end of that day, you'll put together a PowerPoint presentation that will be delivered um, uh, as a group at the end of the last day together, and then you'll prepare a little patent application associated with your design. More information on that as we approach that last day. So for the first four days, it's almost like a class, and then that last day we'll do something quite different, okay? Um, there's uh, not a whole lot of safety issues in this room. We're going to be working with some lasers, but these are relatively low-powered lasers, sufficient that if you caught a laser in the eye, you would blink before you would incur any damage. Really? In your mailbox, right? Are you expecting it? Yeah. Going to have to beat um, That's okay. Vince, would you do me the favor of printing out a copy of all the sheets? We'll, we'll assemble a notebook. I can grab one and photocopy it. You, you don't want it. To, well, you can, I guess. It's a pain to take them out of there, but it's fine. They won't need them until the end of the morning. And you can probably grab a, you know, preferably a yellow folder, but Barbara doesn't have one. Yes. So. Um, anyway, so these instruct these uh, little notebooks I gave you, please don't write in them again. Um, uh, I will give you a sheet to write on a little later. Um, uh, I am going to collect your lab notebook pages, uh, but I'm only going to do that at the end of the last day. You'll rip them all out and hand them in as one big stat, so you don't have to turn those in on a daily basis. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so safety-wise, there's not a lot to be concerned about. I don't know if Vince turned this on. Did he turn it on? Nothing is going. <laughs> I, I don't, I... Now it's recording. Oh, well, we might have just reset what Vince is trying to do. <coughs> Too bad for Vince. Um, okay, so uh, the material is essentially, today we're going to talk about um, geometric optics. I'll talk about what geometric optics means and just a little bit of thinking about that. Um, and uh, we'll put together some devices this afternoon, which are just classic optics type devices, uh, telescopes, magnifiers, things like that. So um, this, this today might be the material that some of you have seen before, if you've ever seen any optics before. But um, tomorrow uh, we will uh, do a day on lasers. And what I mean by a day on lasers is we will talk about how lasers work. And then you will spend the afternoon assembling a laser. Um, so you see these fancy looking tubes here. These are not lasers. They will become a laser. You will create a laser out of them, but for now they are nothing but helium neon discharge tubes. And you're going to turn them into functioning lasers. And you're going to use those lasers for the rest of field session. Um, so, uh, so tomorrow will be sort of laser day. And then on the next day, uh, we're going to talk about polarization. And then the next day we'll talk about interference. And then the last day will be your projects. So <coughs> starting uh, with um, the material for today, we're going to talk about optics in general and then focus on geometric optics. So if, uh, and you, you are definitely going to want to reorient yourselves to whatever is, I apologize, this room is not ideally laid out for the uh, lecture. All work together so we can make it happen. That's teamwork. Uh, and you're you are going to stay in the groups that you have self-selected for the rest of the, the week. So hopefully you are with people that you can tolerate at least, and maybe even like I don't know, or come to like. Maybe you hate them now, but you'll come to like them. I don't know. 
we make good friends in optics. So um, if I were to uh, meet you in a dark alley at night and hold a gun to your head and say, define optics for me, this is a pretty good answer. Especially if I'm the one holding the gun. <laughs> I'll give you the answer that I would want. Um, optics is a subfield of ENM. Concerned with light and its interaction with matter. Okay, I, won't, I won't be writing a lot of sentences on the board, but that's the one sentence I will write. Um, and the reason I write that is because uh, it, it conveys quite a few things right, up, right from the get go. Um, you guys know EM, right? Took Physics 200. You got an A? Get close to an A. Okay, you took physics 200. Let's just start with that. Um, ah, yeah. my yellow notebook. Yep. Oh. Dang. Snap. You Text Vince. Call out. Call out. Here call out. Um, anyway, uh, you took physics 200. You took physics 200. So ostensibly, you know electricity and magnetism. So you already know optics. Right. So we're done. Yeah. That's it. You already know. It. Um, no, truthfully, uh, sorry, thank you. No, that's, that's cool. Thank you very much. Um, so, so everything in optics is already a part of electricity and magnetism. So if we wanted to go, you know, and derive something in optics, we could go back to the fundamental principles of electromagnetism that you've already seen. Fortunately, we're not going to do it that way. Because the last thing you want to do is try and solve Maxwell's equations to figure out what a lens does. We'll talk about what we will do um, in, in just a bit. Uh, a subfield, because there's a lot of stuff in EM that we don't care about in optics. We don't care about parallel plate capacitors and circuits and things like that. We're really interested in electromagnetic radiation and how electromagnetic radiation behaves when it moves from one medium to another. So that's the interaction of light with matter. So uh, when we talk about uh, EM, there's two broad levels at which we can we can uh, uh, talk about ENM. We can talk about it at the classical level, and at the classical level, which is where you probably study the ENM the most, you know that the theory is governed by Maxwell's equations, which tell us what what do Maxwell's equations tell you. They equate uh, a, bunch, a bunch of derivatives of um, the electric and magnetic fields concerned with the concerned with the field of light and one of the different values. Okay, so you're kind of giving me the mathematical structure of Maxwell's equations, but aside, they're a set of equations. Let's just say that, and they contain electric and magnetic fields. But what do they tell you? How sources create fields. Good. That's the perfect answer. Exactly. So Maxwell's equations tell us how sources create fields. That's exactly half of the story of the What's the other half? We already got one. He brought it back. Sorry. That's my out. What's what's the other half of EM? So you you have sources that create fields, and then you want to do how fields interact with things. So how things are influenced by those fields. So what happens to a test particle when you put it in there? What what governs that? Stick a charge in an electric field. This is the force on it. Lorentz force. Yeah, it's the Lorentz force law in the Newtonian mechanics. So, okay, so that's 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 electricity and magnetism as you studied it in physics 200, um, and we know that in that scenario, if you take Maxwell's equations and you beat them into the form of a wave equation, then you find these nice uh, wave-like solutions of oscillating electric and magnetic fields which is time variation source each other and so emerges this sort of classical picture of electromagnetic radiation that we will refer to rather often. So we have a K vector which denotes the direction of propagation of the wave and then transverse to the K vector we have an oscillating electric field. Electricity is blue, I don't know, I don't know if you know that so I always draw it with the blue marker. That was a joke, not a laugh. 
stuff audience. Maybe it's early. What section are you guys coming from? Oh, that's right. Two different things. Ah, it's confusing. All right. Never mind. I was going to try to blame it on your last instructor, but. Okay. So this is the classical picture of electromagnetic radiation. You have the oscillating magnetic field, the oscillating electric field. They are perpendicular to each other, and they are also perpendicular to the direction of propagation. We'll refer to this picture quite a bit. Okay. Now, a lot of what we're going to talk about is, is uh, living perfectly happily in the classical level of, of analysis of electricity and magnetism. But there is at least one uh, scenario where we're going to have to worry about the quantum version of this, and that is when we talk about lasers. You can't really understand how a laser works unless you know a little bit about the quantum mechanical version of electricity and magnetism. And if you just wanted to know the correct way to do quantum mechanical electricity and magnetism, it's a subject called quantum electrodynamics. Uh, we're not going to do quantum electrodynamics in this class. We're going to just pretty much rely on more model type ideas, the things you saw in modern physics. So, you know, don't worry, you don't have to learn quantum field theory to do optics, but you do have to know that uh, atoms and molecules have energy levels, and when electrons move between energy levels, they tend to emit or absorb photons as characteristic energies. Um, so we'll talk more about that tomorrow when we go into lasers, uh, but certainly in the quantum mechanical version, you're all familiar with the fact that light behaves more particle-like, um, or we like to think of it in terms of photons. So much of optics, we want to worry about the fact that light is photons, but when we talk about lasers, the fact that they're photons is going to become crucial. Okay, so if we're, so if we know electricity and magnetism and we want to start doing optics, um, you know, I could give you a lens and I could give you a light source and I could say, here's the geometry of the lens. The light is a wave shining into this lens. Here's what the lens is made of. Go solve Maxwell's equations with the appropriate boundary conditions and tell me what happens, all right? That would, that would suck. You guys don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to teach you that. Um, and we're not going to do that in optics. And truthfully, when you do optics, that's not the kind of thing you spend a lot of time doing. What we are going to do is we're going to use a couple of what I like to call guiding principles. These are, uh, these are quick shortcuts to figure out what's going to happen. Um, they are. They can be derived from these frameworks, from Maxwell's equations, and Lorentz force law, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to derive them, okay? But we're just going to lay out what they are and use them. Um, and in these these guiding principles that we're going to use uh, are largely useful in two different levels of approximation. And um, let me tell you what those levels of approximation are. Uh, first of all, there is what we call the geometric approximation or what is often called ray optics. And in the geometric approximation, what we do is, this is the grossest approximation. It throws out the most information. It, it, it really just simplifies things as much as you can possibly imagine. In the geometric approximation, you take this complicated looking picture of classical electromagnetic radiation and you replace it with this. You literally ignore the fact that it's actually a wave. You ignore that there's anything wiggling. You just say it goes. Okay. Um, I like to say in the geometric limit, light does what rocks do. So you throw a rock, a rock goes. A rock is not a wave. A rock is a rock. Okay. When we're working in the geometric approximation, uh, to figure out what's going to happen, how things are going to behave, we're going to make use of the guiding principle called Fermat's principle. And I'll tell you what Fermat's principle is soon enough, um, and we'll use it to figure out what light does. But generally speaking, if you're working in the geometric approximation, you're only keeping, in, you're only keeping information about the propagation direction. Um, you can kind of think of it as really just sort of ballistic trajectories, like you're throwing rocks, and we're going to use Fermat's principle. In certain situations, we're going to have to bring in a little more information. Okay, we're going to look, see phenomena, circumstances where we can't just treat things like um, these sort of ballistic things. And in that situation, we 
find ourselves working in the domain of what's called physical or wave optics. And when we do physical optics, we don't necessarily have to go back and revisit this full picture of electromagnetic radiation and solve equations and so forth and so on. Um, but rather what we do is we start with all of the results we got from the geometric approximation and we add to it a couple of important effects that come about because light is actually comprised of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So for example, uh, there are important effects that come from the notion of polarization. We'll talk more about polarization in a couple of days. We'll do a whole day on polarization. Um, of course, if you have waves, things are wiggling back and forth, you can talk about interference standard notions of constructive and destructive interference, or general states of interference. And then another related aspect, which is just actually a certain manifestation of interference, and that is the notion of diffraction, the idea that um, light can turn corners. Okay. In the physical limit, light is definitely not going to behave in a way that is analogous to what rocks do. Last time I checked, if you throw a rock through a window, it doesn't hook a left. Okay, they just go straight through the window. But, but light, when you're in this level of approximation, can do that. It can turn a corner. We'll see an example of that in just a minute. If we're working in the physical wave level of approximation, then our guiding principle to tell us what is going to happen is something called Huygens construction. So these are the two levels of approximation that we're going to make heavy use of. Today, we're going to live pretty much in this grossest level of approximation, ray optics. So we'll talk about um, Fermat's principle and how to employ it in just a minute. And then starting on uh, the day after tomorrow, we'll, we'll investigate polarization. And then on the last day, we'll talk about interference and diffraction. Um, now, if I give you approximations, Generally, the reason we use approximations is because these should be easier to, to use than trying to solve things fully, right? So this looks pretty easy. This looks maybe a little bit more complicated. And if you try to solve Maxwell's equations, it will be really hard. But whenever you're working with an approximation, one of the most important things to start with is to ask, when is the approximation valid? When can I do that? When can you get away with this? And when do you have to start taking these two things, or these sorts of things into account, OK? So to answer that question, what we're going to do is actually start by talking a little bit about Huygens construction, use it to look at a few examples, and that's going to tell us when we can afford to make this approximation versus when we have to take these things into account. So, Huygens construction <coughs> says the following. Okay, and I'm just going to kind of do this pictorially, and then we, later on in the week we'll actually do this mathematically in a lot of detail. Well, Wiggins construction basically says the following. Suppose I have a light wave which is happily propagating alone. Now, I'm drawing a bunch of parallel lines. You might say, why in the world does that represent a light wave? Well, what I have in mind is maybe this is our light wave, and I'm looking down on it. So what I'm looking at is the, is the crests of the wave. So these are the peaks in the electric field oscillation. And right now, I'm drawing what we call a plane wave. That is, the peaks form these long parallel lines. There are other geometries of potential wave crests we'll talk about in due time. But for now, this is just like looking down on an ocean wave from the sky. Okay, the lines that you see are the peaks of the waves. So uh, I've got this wave. It's maybe propagating to the right. And for most of what we talk about, we will largely ignore the magnetic field. We'll always think about the electric field if we want to represent the wave type behavior. If you know the electric field, you know the direction of propagation, you can always go back and work out what's happening with the magnetic field. So we don't really have to include it in the discussion to be complete. Um, so this wave is coming along, and it's gotten to this point. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use Huygens construction to figure out what happens next. So Huygens construction says the following. Take your last wave crest and break it up into a bunch of little dots. You can do that. You can do this when you're a little kid. You draw dots. How many dots? Well, how much time do you have on your hands? Put a lot of dots in there. And now, the second step is to take each of those dots 
and allow them to emit a forward going wave of the same wavelength as the wave that, that was coming in. Now if a point makes a wave, what kind of pattern do you think the wave moves out in? So I'm hearing circle, radial. Away from the point? Say again? Yeah. Outwards from, from, from the point? Well, outwards from the point, but what kind of pattern? So circular is, is the two-dimensional answer, but we live in three dimensions, so spherical, right. So if a point source emits, is it on? Yeah. I just can't see what you're writing. You can't see what I'm writing? That's OK. You just need the words and the awesomeness. Um, all right. Anyway, so if a point source is emitting something, it's 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 symmetric in the di in the direction that things go. So it should be a spherical thing. So say if I pick one of these points, the next wave crest from the point source would be something like this. Okay. Maybe I do that a little bit too far out. It should have the same wavelength as the incoming wave. So maybe something. Like this. Okay. So it's circular if I draw it in the board. It's two dimensional, but in three dimensions, it's spherical. So I let each and every point that I drew emit one of these forward going waves. So I just compound a whole bunch of these little arcs. Okay. And now the last step of Huygens construction is that we take all of those forward going waves and we add them together allowing them to interfere. So if we have two peaks overlapping, we get a maximum. If we get two uh, dark spots overlapping, we get a, a minimum. And then if we get a peak overlapping with a trough, then they, they effectively cancel each other. And if we add up all of these things, it's probably not too surprising to you that we will find a line of constructive interference that is parallel to the wave crests that were coming in. And lo and behold, I have just spent a lot of energy deriving something which you could have guessed. And a lot of line of parallel wave crests. What happens next? You get another parallel wave crest. Okay. So uh, this is a little bit of overkill, but um, when you're when you're working with a new tool, you know, a rule of thumb, it's always good to apply it to a situation where you already know the answer make sure that it gives you the right answer because now we're going to take it and apply it to a situation where the answer is not so obvious. So any questions about Huygens construction? Again, I'm doing this pictorially, so you have to take a lot of this for granted. We will do this mathematically um, in uh, three days. So now what I want to do is consider my wave coming in, and this time I'm going to let it hit an opaque screen that has a hole in it. So the black lines are simply an opaque thing, and then where I break the line, this white part, that's just a hole. So the light can happily travel through the hole, but when it hits the black lines, it stops. Okay. So what we can do now is apply Huygens construction in this scenario. We take the last wave crest, we break it up into a bunch of dots, but this time, when we let each of those dots emit the forward going wave, if a dot is behind a black line, we don't worry about its forward going wave because it's, it's, it's opaque. It's stopped by that opaque surface. So the only dots we really care about are actually the ones that are inside the hole. So if we take those dots and we do a forward going wave crest from each of them, we begin to draw a picture that looks just like what we did before, except we stop. We don't go infinitely off the top and the bottom. If we add all of these up, what we find is a picture something like the following. We get roughly a line that's parallel to the lines coming in, but then as you move away over the opaque part of the hole, you get what I'm going to draw as a dotted line. And then you can continue this to figure out what happens next. And so the picture that emerges is something like this, where the dotted lines indicate that the intensity in these directions is getting diminished as you go closer and closer to tangent to the surface. Most of the intensity is concentrated in these parallel lines moving along the center. Okay. So 
let's take this result and now ask, okay, what is this telling us about the behavior of light? So light comes in along, you know, these k vectors. And if a k vector happens to hit an opaque part of the screen, it stops. But if a k vector happens to, to be directed right at the hole, then it, for the most part, just goes straight through. And to the degree that this, this fringe effect is, is, is small compared to the main contribution going through the center, we can ignore it. Looking at this, the light is pretty much behaving like a rock. You have a window and you're throwing rocks through the window. If you miss, the rock hits the wall and stops. But if it goes through the window, it just keeps going through the window. Okay. So what level of approximation would you say applies here? Geometric or physical? Geometric. Yeah, this is behaving in this geometric approximation. So long as we can sort of ignore these fringing effects. Okay. Now, to understand how to get the physical context, we can take an extreme version of this same scenario. So now we'll have our incoming wave come in. But this time, we're going to take this thing and make the hole quite small. In fact, let's just say we made it so small that uh, mathematically, when I try and apply Huygens construction, I can only draw one point in the hole. Now, if that point emits a forward going wave, what's the pattern of that wave? Spherical. spherical. That means equal intensity in all directions. So when I draw the forward going wave, it looks like this. Now if we take that picture and from it infer what light is doing, again if light hits the opaque part of the screen then it stops, but if light hits the hole, it can have, it can happily travel straight through, or it can just as happily turn a corner. All right. Last time I checked, this is behavior decidedly unlike what rocks do. It'd be cool if you could throw a rock through a window and get it to the left, but it doesn't do that. So this is the wave-like behavior of light. In particular, you're seeing the effects of diffraction, light turning corners. And so now I will pose the question to you. This is the physical or the, the geometric limit. This is more of a physical optics type thing. What controls whether you can use the geometric approximation versus having to take into account wave-like behavior? So make a statement. What about the size of the hole? Comparable. Well, as the hole gets smaller, light becomes more physical. Okay, as the hole gets smaller, then light becomes more, more wave-like. Like. The wave-like behavior of light becomes more manifest. Okay, so what is a small hole? Size of the wave vector. Okay. So when we use the word small, or when we use the word large, if you want to say this is a large hole, um, small and large don't really mean anything in any in, in, in isolation. I mean, you know, you're small compared to the universe, but you're large compared to an ant. So when we say large and small, we always have to have it define with respect to something. If you look at these pictures, there's only one length scale aside from the size of the hole, and that's the wavelength of the light. Okay. So I think this is what you're alluding to. If the wavelength is much, much less than the size of the hole, if we call the size of the hole D, then you can use uh, the geometric approximation. As soon as your wavelength gets on the order of the size or as soon as your the hole gets on the size, get, is on the order of the size of the wavelength, then you're definitely going to have to take into account diffraction, interference, and so forth. Okay. Um, now, there's a couple of things that I want to say about this before we move on, and that is, um, first of all, I derived this situation by thinking about light moving through a hole. But truthfully, there, this is a very robust conclusion. So for example, it doesn't have to be the size of a hole necessarily. It could be actually the size of an object. So if I have an object, a big object and a small object, and I shine light onto these two objects, 
in the first case, if the object itself is much bigger than the wavelengths of the light that's hitting it, then light behaves geometrically. That is, if it hits the object, it stops. If it misses the object, it just goes straight on. Okay? In this scenario, if I put a viewing screen behind here, what would I see? You'd see a shadow, exactly. You'd just see a shadow. So you'd see this big dark blob with the shape of the, the object itself. However, if the object you're illuminating is, it has a size on the order of the wavelength of the light that you're, you're using, if you look on the screen behind it, you'll actually see interference fringes. Okay? So it doesn't necessarily have to be the size of a hole, it can be the size of an object. It could also be the difference in sizes of two things. You could have two large things, but if the difference in their sizes is on the order of the wavelength of light, then you can see the effects of physical objects. So this is a very robust conclusion that if, with, if you have a physical system with links on the order, some length scale on the order of the wavelength of light, then you typically have to take into account these sorts of phenomena. And we'll explore situations like that in various activities. <laughs> now, everything that I've said, absolutely everything that I've said applies to light. It applies to any other wave, sound waves, seismic waves, waves in your face, whatever wave you can think of. This is all a discussion that you can have for any type of wave. There are levels where any type of wave behaves geometrically, and then there are scenarios where any type of wave has to, you know, you have to treat it with these uh, wave-like effects. Okay. But for light, because that's not what we're interested in here, um, we can ask ourselves, when am I going to be able to use this geometric approximation? When is that going to be valid? Well, what are the characteristic wavelengths of visible light? 400 to 700 nanometers. That is a very small wavelength. Okay, most things, things in this room, you, me, our eyeballs, most things in this room have sizes which are much, much larger than 400 to 700 nanometers. So for most scenarios, we're going to be able to make use of the geometric approximation. Despite the fact that this is a really gross approximation, it throws out a lot of information, it applies in most scenarios. In fact, we've got to work kind of hard to see these effects. All right. So with that in mind, we're going to spend the rest of the day working in the geometric approximation. And we will come back and revisit wave-like behavior a little later on. Um, so what I want to do now is apply Fermat's principle to determine what light can do if I'm working in this geometric approximation. Okay, so we can ask, in the geometric limit, what does light do? Okay, we're, we're throwing out a lot of really useful stuff about light completely ignoring the fact that it's a wave. So you might think that you can't really do very much with what's left over, but it turns out you can. You can do a lot of really important things with it, and we will. Um, but in order to explore what light can do, uh, we're going to have to make use of Fermat's principle. So let's, let's talk about Fermat's principle for a minute, and then we'll apply it uh, to various scenarios to see what light can do. So Fermat's principle, says the following, uh, light travels from A to B along the path of least transit time. Okay. You'll notice in that that I'm not saying it travels along the shortest path, but rather it travels along the path of least transit time, and there's going to be important distinctions between those two. Okay, but that is from Matt's principle. Um, again, you can derive this from, you know, Maxwell's equations and so forth if you'd like. But we're just going to take it as given and see how we can apply it to uh, the geometric situation. 
to investigate what light can do. So uh, to apply this, we have to kind of see, all right, what, uh, what's a scenario where we can think about applying Fermat's principle? So instead of thinking about light for a moment, let's just go back and talk about something more physical. So um, you guys that came from electronics, or if you've taken any electronics course, you guys all know Steve. Steve is the happiest guy on earth. <laughs> is often happy because he's drinking a martini. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Steve, and Steve's drinking his martini one afternoon after a heavy day of field session. He's out on Cafodar Commons, <laughs> kicking it with a martini. And Alex is out on Cafodar Commons as well. And Alex is not so happy because he just got back from exercising. He tried to eat a banana. Swallowed it sideways, so now he's choking <laughs> on a banana. The red banana. I don't know where you get the red bananas. But. So Steve, being the great guy that he is, looks at Alex choking on the other end of Cafodar and says, you know what? I should get to him as quickly as I can to save his life. After I finish the martini, of course. <laughs> so the question now is, if Steve is starting at his location, we could call it A, and I'm sitting at location B, uh, what route should Steve take to get to me if he wants to get there as quickly as possible? He should travel in a straight line. Hopefully. <laughs> yes, he might have around. <laughs> I'm going to go that way. <laughs> He'll go in a straight line. Okay. Um, we have just applied for mass principle, and we have actually just uncovered the behavior of light in at least one scenario. So we can conclude that if light is moving in a medium, that's a material which is uniform, that is, nothing is changing. In a uniform media, light moves along straight lines. So that you, you, you might that, that result might be somewhat intuitive. And again, it's good to see that something gives us a result which we would have expected. But now let's see if we can apply it to a scenario which is maybe a little less uh, intuitive. So um, secretly what you guys don't know is at the end of every field session, Steve and I jump on a plane and we fly to Hawaii together. And uh, Steve, uh, he likes to sit on the beach drink martinis. Or, we talked about this. I don't know. First of all, they have green sand in Hawaii, the beach we go to. And I don't, and maybe it's not a martini. I don't know what it was that they drink in Hawaii. Who goes to Hawaii? I let them drink in Hawaii. My I say my ties. It's not my ties. I don't know. Bahama Mama. Bahama Mama. <laughs> uh, huh? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. They span though. Okay, so um, so Steve is on the beach enjoying his martini, and I go for a swim. Okay, and of course I'm dissatisfied because I'm drowning. <laughs> now I forgot. I don't know how to swim. So I'm out in the beach, drowning. Steve's enjoying his uh, martini on the on the beach, and uh, he sees me out in the water, and he says, "Oh, who see about <laughs> After I finish my martini, so Steve finishes his martini, and then he's like, I need to get to Alex as quickly as I can. Time is of the essence. He's dying. Um, how should, what, what trajectory should Steve take to get to me? Yeah, so, trajectory where he swims the least. So, yeah, so you might think um, he should try and cover more of the distance on the beach and the least amount of distance in the water as possible. So maybe he would run to about here, and then he would swim towards me. Okay. Uh, what you don't know, though, is that Steve is actually a turtle. <laughs> I think that should be manifestly obvious, but it, it, it just surprises people when I say that. And being a turtle, Steve actually is much faster in the water. He's like Aquaman. He's much faster in the water than he is on land. So, you know, he should spend as little time on land as possible and then cover more of the distance in the water. Okay. 
But what you really don't know is that um, Steve's parents are Aquaman and the Flash. <laughs> and he runs as fast as he swims. And if he runs at exactly the same speed that he swims, what path should he take to get to me? Right. He should just travel along a straight line because it doesn't matter where he is to move the same speed. Okay, now I'm just kind of laying out all these hypotheticals, but in determining the path that Steve should take to get to me, what is the thing we have to take into consideration? How fast he runs versus how fast he swims. We need to take into account the velocity here compared to the velocity here. Okay. In general, if these two numbers are different, then his trajectory will have a kink in it. There will be a bend. If these two numbers happen to be the same, then you're actually looking at this scenario. So we can take this and now uh, deduce a second result, and that is that at a discrete interface, that is, if I have two materials that are uniform and then they meet at an interface, okay, they are otherwise uniform and then the, trend, the properties change abruptly as you move across the interface. So at a discrete interface, light refracts. This is the phenomenon of refraction. Okay? That is, it bends. And we'll quantify all this in just a few minutes. So that's another, that's another thing that can happen. Um, but there's one more thing we can talk about. And, and by the way, uh, we can actually apply um, Fermat's principle quantitatively. We can, we can do the math to determine exactly what the trajectory is. Okay, there's a little bit of calculus involved. You're, you're trying to get the least time of transit given the velocities. And so you can imagine you could set up an arbitrary trajectory and then take a derivative and set it equal to zero to extra minus the thing. We won't do that. I'll just show you the results in a few minutes. But you can be more quantitative with this. I know pictures are fun. I like pictures. But you can actually do real physics with this. Okay, one more scenario. So Steve saves me, because he's a good guy, and he puts me on the beach, and, you know, I'm, I'm on the beach now with Steve, um, but, of course, I'm sad, because in, in recovering, I tried to eat a banana, <laughs> oh, and I swallowed it sideways, and I'm choking again, and Steve is like, you know, what would really help Flournoy is just to give him a glass of water. He's not getting my martini. <laughs> so Steve, like, I'm going to finish my martini. I'm going to run to the water. I'm going to grab some salt water. <laughs> what was Steve thinking? And I'm going to go give it to Flournoy to, 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 to drink. So the trick here is Steve has to get from where he is to where I am, subject to the fact that he has to touch the water. So in that scenario, what path do you think Steve would take if he wanted to get to me as quickly as possible but having to touch the water. Equal lengths. Yeah, he would he would actually travel along this symmetric path where each leg has equal lengths. It is the shortest distance subject to having to go to this interface. Okay. In the context of light, this is of course what we call reflection. So what we found from applying Fermat's principle is that light moves in straight lines if the medium isn't changing. If you hit a discrete interface, it refracts and it reflects, and we'll quantify that in just a minute. The third situation, uh, I won't draw a picture for it, it's a little harder, is the following. Um, if we don't want to consider a discrete interface, what we can say is that through a continuous interface, so what I mean by a continuous interface is that the properties are changing, but they're not changing abruptly at one position. They're gradually changing as you move through the material. As light moves through a continu continuous interface, it only refracts, it doesn't reflect. Can I give me an example of what might constitute a continuous interface? 
what would that mean? What would that even mean? The beach. The beach? As you start to walk in, you can still walk a little ways, but then it starts to... Well, that... Okay, so in this example, I actually agree with you. Um, but in, in the context of light, let's, let's, let's talk... Because there you would go from air to water, and that's discrete. But in this example, I agree with you. But in terms of light and its propagation, what would constitute a continuous interface? Just give me an example. Like what? The atmosphere. Um, yeah, the atmosphere. The atmosphere is a great example. If you go vertically upwards, okay, properties of the atmosphere change. It's not like you get to 30 feet and all of a sudden all the air is gone. No, they change gradually as you move up. Well, that affects the propagation of light. So the atmosphere is a great continuous interface. If you have a very large body of water, like the ocean, that's a great continuous interface. Okay. So examples of continuous... I mean, you could take a non-uniform gas in a cylinder or something. Okay, that's, that's going to be a non-continuous interface. Okay, so with this in mind, um, we've kind of covered the three main possibilities. And so now what I want to do is give a little bit more quantitative information about reflection and refraction. And then we're going to take a short uh, break, stretch our legs, go to the bathroom. And then when we come back, we will talk about how we use these ideas to create optical instruments. So um, I don't think I need to dwell a lot on one. Make sure you guys can draw straight lines. There's not a lot quantitative there. So let's skip down to two and talk about reflection and refraction. And again, most of you have seen this before at some level, so I'm going to be uh, quick with it. Um, let's first of all talk about reflection. It's probably the easier of the two. In fact, I would say the law of reflection is probably one of the simplest equations you'll encounter in all of physics. Um, the standard way that we illustrate a scenario is to say the discrete interface is some horizontal line. We're going to have a light ray come down on that interface. And we're going to get some reflected ray. Okay. The reflected ray, uh, we can talk about its trajectory. We talk about the trajectories of everything by drawing a normal to the surface and then indicating the angle that the incident beam makes with respect to that normal. We call that theta incident. And then the reflected beam is going to reflect off the surface with some angle theta r. Again, measured from the, the normal. And the law of reflection simply states that theta reflected is equal to theta incident. Okay. Which again, comes from applying for math principle. Saying, I want to get from here to here, but subject to having to touch this interface. And you'll find that the angles have to be the same. Now, as I write it, you could have just as well used these two angles, okay? But for the case of refraction, you cannot arbitrarily switch your angles. So by convention, we always measure all of our angles with respect to the normal. So just get used to that. That's the way it's going to be. So the law of reflection is so simple, it, it, we, we might just ought to stop talking about it and move on. But we can actually say something interesting about reflection. So um, let's consider taking a, a surface that's smooth and having several light beams hit it. So if we take like a point source of light over here, it's sending out light in all directions. And we can just consider some of the light that's hitting the surface, and now we can apply the law of reflection. So everywhere the light hits the surface, we draw a normal. And then for each of those beams, we reflect, making sure we obey the law of reflection. And now we can take the situation and we can ask the following interesting question. If there was a big eyeball, and eyeballs are of course green, if there was a big eyeball in the sky looking at this scenario, what would it observe? Well, first of all, the eyeball could look directly at this source of light. And if it looked directly at this source of light, what it would see is it would see light coming from the source hitting the lens of the eye, that light would be coming 
in a spherical pattern, the rays is seeming as if they're diverging from this point. And then the lens of your eye can take that and it can, and we'll talk about lenses in detail in a, in a little while, but it, it can take those spherically diverging rays and then collapse them to form an image in the back of the eye. So you see this, you look at this, you see it. However, it can also look down at the surface. And if it looked down at the surface, it might see these rays of light coming in toward the lens <coughs> of the eye. But to the eye, those beams of light are going to appear as if they're originating from that point, below the surface. The, the eye doesn't know any better. All the eye has is the light coming into them. So it's going to take these beams and form an image and conclude there's a source of light down here. Okay. Of course, this is what a mirror does. So this is what we call uh, specular reflection. That is, we have a smooth surface, and when we reflect light off that surface, we get these really nice symmetric patterns, and if you look, you tend to see these kinds of results. Now we can contrast that with another situation, which is if we have a point source of light, and this time it's illuminating a surface which is not smooth. Okay, maybe it's bumpy. If we take a few sort of representative beams of light in this scenario, and we let it obey the law of reflection by drawing the normal at each point, drawing the reflected beams, then we can ask ourselves in this scenario, what would the big eye in the sky see? Of course, you can look at the source of light. You can always look at the source of light. And you'll get a nice image form from that. But if you look down at the surface, the, re the beams of light coming off the surface are not going to trace backwards and appear as if they're coming from some common point. Okay? It's just sloppy. It's messy. This is what we call diffuse reflection. off of a lumpy, bumpy surface. So now I might pose the following question to you. Which of these two types of reflection do you think is more useful? Who says specular? Who says diffuse? Why do you say diffuse reflection is more useful? surface looks microscopic and probably using basically what the image is that's produced. So it's, it's not a mirror surface anymore. It's you guys are way too high tech for me. <laughs> are you looking at the specular reflection? Like you can see all like fine and well, but like as, as long as you're as the beam is hitting you. Like, whereas, like, the bumpy surface, if you have enough light hitting it, you'll be able to make out a better picture as long as you have enough light hitting it. Like, you don't have to be in a certain position. Okay. That makes sense. So, so let me ask you this. On a day-to-day -day basis, which of these two things do you rely on more? Diffuse. Who says speculative? Who says diffuse? Folks, diffuse reflection is how you see things. If I look at you, I see you because of light diffusively reflecting off of you. If you look at a mirror, you do not see the mirror. You see the specular reflections of the things illuminating the mirror. Everything you see in this room, you are seeing because of diffuse reflection. It is how you see things. It, it, you can take it and you can do things with it. You can talk about the microscopic stuff, but just generally, how you see things is, is a byproduct of diffuse reflection. So even the messy stuff has its use. Okay, the, the structure of surfaces, the fact that there are holes in this table, the fact that you know this has got texture, all of that is, is utilizing diffuse reflection. Of course, specular reflection has its uses, but if you look around this room, there's not too much specular reflection going on right now. Okay. All right, so, so that's reflection. Now let's quickly jump to the other phenomena um, that we're familiar with, and that is refraction. 
So for refraction, we can start with roughly the same <coughs> picture. But this time we're more interested in the beam that's moving through the medium. It goes past the interface. So now we have some beam which is actually propagating in the new material. Uh, its trajectory can be indicated by, confusingly enough, theta r, which now stands for theta refractive. Hopefully you'll never get those confused. Reflective and refractive. And we've already said that um, this trajectory is going to depend at some level on the velocity with which light moves in the incident medium compared to the velocity with which mo light moves in the refracted medium. That was our example of running on the beach and then swimming in the water. Okay. Um, the problem with this as our parameter is uh, world peace. Right? We all hate each other in the world. We can't get along. And the root of all evil in the world, you know, all conflict, wars everywhere would just end if we could all adopt the same set of units. I guess you guys didn't realize this, but the reason why there are wars between nations is because imperial units, the metric system, if we could all just adopt the same units, we would all get along, okay? But, um, but we don't get along, and so the problem is, is if, if I give you these velocities, the numbers I give you are different depending on what unit system I'm using, right? If I give you the speed of light in miles per hour, that's a very different number than in meters per second, which is a very different number than if you use my favorite units for velocity, furlongs per fortnight. Um, but the point is, is like it's inconvenient that these numbers are different for different unit systems. So scientists, of course, are the people that are out to save the world and restore world peace. So scientists are smart enough to say, well, let's just get rid of the units. Let's form dimensionless ratios of the light, the speed of light in a vacuum, C, which is a velocity, to the speed of light in a medium. We call this the index of refraction in that medium. And the wonderful thing is that the index of refraction is something the whole world can agree on. Because it doesn't matter what units you use. The units in the top can the units in the bottom. And as you're all probably aware, in terms of the index of refraction, we now have a, an equation which relates the incident and the refracted angles, and this is called Snell's Law. And it says that Ni sine theta i is Nr sine theta r. Again, you could derive this from Maxwell's equations and Lorentz Force Law, but you could also derive it quantitatively from Fermat's principle. We're not going to worry about it. But you, you now see why you have to stick to the right convention for defining your angles. Because if you wanted to try and use this angle, you'd have to rewrite that with cosines. Okay. So you've all seen Snell's Law before, right? Probably from Vince or some other physics two personality, maybe even in your high school physics class. And you've worked with it. It's just a sine, sine function, nothing too complicated. But let's see if we can talk about um, something interesting here. So consider um, the scenario when nr is less than ni. Okay, if nr is less than ni, how does the refracted angle relate to the incident angle? Is it the same, larger, smaller? It's bigger, exactly. So in this scenario, our refracted beam would actually be then away from the normal. Now in this scenario, this raises an interesting possibility because what we can do is we can increase the angle of incidence until we hit a certain critical value, which I'll call theta c, and at that critical value, the refracted beam is actually moving parallel to the surface. Okay. What becomes more interesting is if we then consider the light incident at an angle larger than theta critical. 
Because if, if, theta, if theta instant is larger than theta critical, I've already got the refracted beam parallel to the surface. I can't refract at any more of an angle. So what happens? You reflect. This is a scenario called total internal reflection. I'm sure you guys have heard of it. It can only happen if the incident index of refraction is larger than the refracted index of refraction. But here's an interesting question that I like to pose. Let's think for a moment about starting at theta i that's less than the critical value. So we have a light come in and it's refracted at say this angle. And now I'm going to continuously increase theta i. Continuously, slowly, over small increments. The, the refracted beam will steadily move until it's parallel to the surface. But then something interesting happens. When I reach theta critical, the light is parallel to the surface. But if I move even a tiny bit past theta critical, this refracted beam has to make a discrete jump so that it obeys the law of reflection. Because if you're reflecting, you have to obey the law of reflection. Now, I don't know about you, but that bothers me. Because, you know, this is all governed by differential equations. And differential equations, you know, they're continuous, they're smooth. If you continuously vary the inputs, the outputs, the solutions should continuously vary. But we have something funny happening because we're changing the inputs continuously, but we have this discrete jump in the output, in the behavior of light and what it does. Can anyone explain this to me? Or do you think it's okay? How many of you are bothered by that? You should all be bothered by that. I would say that the folks up at CU aren't bothered by it, but they can't even understand why there's a problem. <laughs> I'll explain this to them, and they're just like, like what? Huh? Are you a turtle? Um, so, can anybody resolve this for me? Or should we just suck it up and accept it that continuously changing inputs can cause discrete, jump, discrete jumps in the outputs? And, and no, don't try and make this quantum. This is not a quantum effect. Well, so light is still reflecting even at indices that are greater than theta C. Exactly. So, so one thing to remember is when I draw this and I say the light refracts, the truth is this is a discrete interface. I should be drawing a reflected beam at all positions. The light is reflecting and refracting. Okay. Now how does this resolve the issue? Because it's continuous, like so. Well what what is happening? Less is, less is refracting. Less is refracting as we get closer to theta critical. So when you say less is refracting, what do you mean? More is reflecting. <laughs> I love it. You're conserving energy. Yeah, so if we, if we, if we speak in terms of intensity, the brightness, what we find is as we increase the angle of incidence, the refracted beam moves towards the surface, but it becomes dimmer and dimmer. And it continuously dims to zero intensity. Meanwhile, the reflected beam is growing in intensity and it continuously grows until it at the critical angle has the full intensity of the incident beam. So everything is changing continuously and it's approaching zero or the intensity of the full beam and nothing makes a discrete jump. Yes? Are we able to model the intensity of the refracted or the reflected beam based on the intensity of the incoming beam? Okay, so we will you can, yes, but that unfortunately goes well beyond the power of the methods that we're using. You actually have to go in and look at Maxwell's equations and boundary conditions. And so talking about transmitted intensities and reflected intensities is something which you hopefully will address in your intermediate or advanced DNM class. We do know that it has to happen here because it's the only way to resolve this, this conflict. But generally speaking, we won't deal with that very much in this block of field session because it involves digging into the math a little more than, than we have time to do. Yes? So the refracted beam has zero intensity at beta critical? Is that what Yeah, yeah, exactly. So as this thing approaches parallel to the surface, it's actually approaching zero. Okay. So, zero so, that, so, that, so that there is no going beyond it. It doesn't okay. blink out. It's just continuously approaching zero. 
Okay, uh, any other questions? All right, you guys uh, go stretch your legs, go to the bathroom if you need to, uh, come back in five minutes and we will see what we can do with this and building devices. Isn't it like legally required of all women? Can we pause? Can pause? Yeah, just stand around. That's cool, gosh. In canonical, the Star Wars era. But the old, I mean, G.I. Joe is a really, really old idea, right? Yeah. But anyway, so moving right along. I had a Barney doll yeah. too, and some money. Like, okay. So, uh, yeah, we're all here. Good. Wow, sixteen of you. That's just insane. This is gonna be a busy room. Uh, all right. So, are there any questions about sort of the foundational things we talked about? Because um, we're gonna take a turn for something different now. Okay. So, before we uh, talk about how we use reflection and refraction to create uh, instruments. Um, there's an idea that comes up that, that comes up when we talk about optical instruments, which we have to really get really well defined. There's lots of ideas in optics that you've seen before, words like focus and image and so forth like that, so forth and so on, things like that. But we're going to use those words and mean something very precise. Okay, so I want to I want to know that we're all on the same page when I say one of these words with what it means. So we're going to start uh, with the word image and what we mean by forming an image. So if we want to form an image with some source of light, we first of all need a source of light. And if I've gone out and explored. I, I'm, I'm fairly well traveled, and I've traveled all around the globe, and I've found that there is uh, singularly one source of light that is better than all others um, that exists, and that is. Uh, a great redwood tree. It's by far it's, it's the most phenomenal source of light. <laughs> Glad you guys got, got this joke. <laughs> so so uh, if you go to sunny Northern California, go to the redwood forest, you see these great redwood trees, and they are in fact, you know, putting off light. You can think of them as reflecting sunlight or whatever. I don't care. They just they're putting off light. It's glorious light and um, and. It's so glorious that you, in fact, you, you go up to California and you buy a house. You just want to stare at that redwood tree, you know, for all your days you know, from in front of your little house. You're little because that's a redwood tree. Okay. But then uh, some guy from CU, uh, you know, who invented beer fusion or something like that, uh, buys the piece of property between you and the tree, and he, uh, just to piss you off because you're smarter than him coming from mines, he erects a large wall. <laughs> large brick wall between you and the great red tree. And you, you go to complain to him and he says, well, you know, the tree is putting off light, the light's hitting the wall. You can just enjoy looking at the image of the tree on the wall. So let's investigate this claim if this actually does in fact happen. So, um, so first of all, uh, you know, in the light of day, this scenario is obviously going to be weird because there's all kinds of other sources of light. So let's simplify it. Let's turn the lights off. Let's make it night. How do you turn the lights off? Put the moon out. <laughs> and then this is the great redwood Christmas tree. <laughs> it's lit up. Green lights in the leaves, and red lights along the trunk, and now this thing is actually shining. Okay? And there is no doubt that in the dark, in the darkness of the Northern California night, light from this tree is hitting the wall. And now the question I pose to you is, do you see an image of the tree on the wall? Who says yes? I'm running this experiment. And my idea is that if I hold my hand up long enough, someone will start holding their hands up. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Who says no? OK, the no's, the no, no's actually right. <laughs> um, I'm not saying that. Okay, so but let's actually investigate why we don't see an image and then what we might change in order to see an image. So let us suppose that we were going to try and see an image of the tree on the wall. We might ask, this leaf right here in the tree is putting out light, okay? And it's like a little point, so it's putting out light in all directions. We talked about that spherically. And some of that light is certainly hitting the wall. 
But the question I might pose to you is, if you saw an image of the tree on the wall, where would you see that leaf? Yeah, it's, it's hitting, the light from that leaf is hitting everywhere on the wall. It's kind of smeared out on the wall. In fact, it gets worse because if you picked a point down in the trunk, it's also sending out light in all directions. And that light is also hitting the wall. So not only do you have the light from the leaf being smeared all over the wall, but the light from any other point on the tree is also smeared all, all over the wall. So everything is on top of everything else and it's clearly not an image of the tree on the wall. The problem that we're finding is that in this scenario, we have what you might call in math lingo, a one to many scenario. One point on the tree, the source, is being mapped to many, many, many points on the wall. And in this, in this situation, we have no image. And I don't mean the mathematical word image. I mean this optical word image. You do not see the tree on the wall. So hopefully, by contrast, it is somewhat evident to you that if I want to get an image, I have to achieve a one-to-one, -one, or maybe a one-to-few, depending, but at least a one-to-one, -one, or a, a, not, not at most, but <laughs> something like one-to-few. <laughs> so if we, if we had a one-to-one, -one, we would definitely have an image, okay? So how can we take this scenario and change it so that we would get a one-to-one -one mapping? What, and before I, before I ask for suggestions, what is the simplest, lowest tech method of doing it? Because you guys are very high tech. You know, Tear you warp space time. Tear it down. Tear it down the wall. <laughs> so you, you had your hand uh, up. A lens. Okay, so that's actually higher tech than you need to go. That will work, but that's actually why I made that qualifier about the lowest tech way to do this. So another wall. Yeah, why don't we take something that's opaque. A wall would work, but a piece of cardboard would do that trick. <laughs> Why don't we take something that's opaque and block out all of the light coming from the tree except for a very small amount? If we do that, then any of the light from the tree that hits the opaque part of this wall <laughs> stops, and only those beams lucky enough to pass through that little hole continue on to the wall. Exactly. In this scenario, hopefully it, it is somewhat intuitive that you would see then an image of the tree on the wall and you know, by this picture it would be inverted. Okay. This idea, this very low-tech means of forming an image from a light source, is what we call pinhole image formation. That is, you take an opaque surface, poke a small hole in it, put it between your source of light and where you want to form the image, and you will form an image. Now let's, let's say a few things about this. First of all, um, you're losing a lot of light, right? You're blocking out a lot of the light coming from the tree. Pinhole image formation doesn't work unless you have a pretty intense source to begin with. Okay? Because generally you lose a lot of light. Now you can try and fix that by making the hole bigger letting more light through. But what problem do you encounter if you make the hole bigger? The image is distorted. Yeah, you distort the image because if you just think about it, if you make the hole bigger, then the light from this point can pass through it with some spread, which means that you're getting a blurry image. So you have this weird trade-off. To get a nice crisp image, you need to make the hole as small as you can. But the smaller you make the hole, the less intensity you're getting to utilize. Okay. So pinhole inf image formation, you know, it, 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 it can be used, but, but it's, not, it's not ideal. It's got its drawbacks. But everything's got its drawbacks, to be honest with you. Um, okay, so the fact that this is upside down, that's not really a problem. Um, if we wanted to take a picture of the tree, what we could do is replace this wall with some photosensitive material. We open the shutter on our pinhole, the light goes through, it hits the photosensitive material, the image is captured there. And then we go to a dark room, develop this. Lo and behold, we've got a picture of the tree. And you know, you hand the picture to someone up at CU and it's upside down and they're just like, oh my god! 
turn the strings upside down, my photography career is ruined. And then you just go up to them and you turn it over. And, okay, and they're like, oh my god, you're a miracle worker. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I joke because when I draw this picture, and I ask what are the what are the problems with pinhole limits formation? A lot of people say the image is upside down, and it's not really that bad. <laughs> but anyway, um, all right. So so that's that's pinhole image formation. Let's see if it works. You know what? Let's do this. So um, I have here a source of light, okay, and it's in this shield just because it's really bright. Um, and uh, if you will do me a favor and hit the lights. Oh, um, you'll notice that uh, this this uh, shield here has a hole right here, and so the light is shining out through the hole towards the ceiling, and now I can pose the question, are we seeing a pinhole image of the source of light on the ceiling? Yeah. It says yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who says no? Okay, well this is not a small hole, see? <laughs> that's why it's got the shield. It's not a small hole at all, okay? But moreover, like that's not the source of light. If you look up there, that's not what the source of light is. What is the source of light in this thing? It's the filament, right? That's just a big white blob. We're not seeing an image of the source. If we want to see an image of the source, what we can do is create a real pinhole situation. And to do that, we can cover this bad boy and now create a truly small hole. Okay. And if you guys can see that, I'm sorry it's on the sort of here we'll do this. There we go. Okay. So we've got a nice image of the actual source of light on the ceiling. And we can play around with this. We can, for example, make a smaller hole. And if I make a smaller hole, what you'll notice is that you should get a crisper image, but at lower intensity. And then you can just make a really obscenely large hole. And you still kind of get an image, but you're clearly, as the hole gets larger and larger and larger, it's getting brighter and brighter, but you're losing the crispness of your image. Okay. All right, you can switch the lights back on. We'll turn this off and start small over here. Burn it. Okay, so that's 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 comforting to know that this actually works. Um, but we can do better, right? Uh, pinhole image formation is effective. You know, early on, this was a good way to form an image. Um, but we have better technology at our disposal. And so nowadays, if, if you had a light source and you wanted to form an image to, say, take a picture, what kind of technology would you use? A lens, a lens right. And, and what a lens does for us, and we're going to go through the systematics of this in due time, but what a lens does for us is it allows us to take the light coming from an object, and instead of blocking out light, the lens redirects it and changes the trajectory so that at some point on the other side of the lens, maybe, you get a one-to-one -one mapping. Remember, images are formed where you have a one-to-one -one mapping. And so you get an image. And again, we'll talk about you know, an analysis of how this redirecting happens. So the, the, the obvious advantage of lens image formation over pinhole is that you can harvest more of the light. In fact, the bigger your lens, the more light you can harvest. Okay. But you don't have this problem of getting necessarily a blurry image like you do with pinhole. Yes? Does the lens also flip it over like it does with the pinhole? That depends. So that's going to be situation dependent. We'll talk about, we'll explore when that happens and how to determine if it happens. Okay. Um, now, what, what is the disadvantage of using a lens? Can anybody see a disadvantage? Have a huge one to the tree. I mean, well, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily have to use a huge one, right? I mean, I'll, make you, I'll give you a hint. Your eyeball is using a lens, and you can see a whole tree when you look at it. it depends yeah. on how far away you are. If you have multiple sources. Say it again? If you have like, multiple sources. 
what would be the problem there? Because when it like pinpointed all to you. well, no, never mind. I was thinking about it wrong. Well, I, I, you're on the right track, though. I think you're thinking along the lines of you, but you can see the problem with one source. Like, what is what is a disadvantage? And it's not a big one. Well, I think you're thinking along the, the same lines. So let me ask you this question. If I took this scenario and I just moved the wall back, would I still see an image? No. If I left everything the same and I just moved the wall back, would I still see an image? Yeah. Yeah. It might be, it'd be bigger, maybe a little dimmer, but it's not gonna like, it's not gonna go out of focus or anything. It's not gonna become blurry. If I wanted to capture the image by putting a screen there, but then I moved the screen there, would I get an image? No. So with lenses, we actually have to be careful about where we're looking for the image. We can't just arbitrarily put a viewing screen or some photosensitive material anywhere we want. Okay. So that's the trade-off. The truth is, though, you know, nature is always going to tell us which of these is the most efficient image maker and nature says lenses that's how your eyeball works okay all right so now that we have down the notion of what an image is it's wherever in a scenario we have achieved a one-to-one -one map now we can actually go through and systematically look at optical devices so we will start with devices built on the principle of reflection and these are of course what we call mirrors and in order to make the analysis interesting, we're going to move beyond the uh, category of flat mirrors. So we've already kind of talked about a flat mirror. Um, and the advantage of a flat mirror is that if you pick different points on the surface, the normal directions are always really easy to find. Remember, the normal is where we measure all the angles from. So knowing what direction the normal uh, is pointing is important. And so for flat mirrors, it's easy because the normals are all parallel to each other. If we want to look at more general scenarios, what do you think is the second simplest scenario? It's not quite as straightforward as flat, but it's not like really complicated. Circular. Circular, exactly, or spherical. If I have a spherical interface, which if I'm drawing on the board, it's circular, if I know where the center of the circle is, and I pick points on the surface and I want to know the normal, all I have to do is connect those points to the center with a line. Because the radial direction is normal to the surface of a circle or a sphere. Okay. So we're going to spend most of our time analyzing spherical interfaces. All right, mathematically, they're somewhat easy. They're not too hard. And in, in fact, a lot of our optical components will be spherical interfaces. Now, spherical interfaces aren't ideal. They actually bring in a level of distortion that we'll talk about in a minute. If you really want to get really nice image formation, you might work with a parabolic interface, which I don't even know how to draw it. But a parabolic interface, you can imagine is a much more complicated beast because you have to know the direction, the normal at each point on the surface, but I don't have a really simple way to say this is the normal. Okay, you have to look at the equations of, of defining parabolas and from them extract, okay, what, what direction would the normal point in this scenario versus that scenario. However, parabolic interfaces do provide better image formation. They give you less distortion. But there's also a practical reason why, I mean, computationally spherical is easier than parabolic. But in terms of manufacturing, spherical is easier than parabolic. Imagine that I gave you the task of taking a piece of glass and cutting it into a spherical interface and then polishing it. So this is optics. We need really nice polished surfaces. If you want to polish something that's spherical, one sort of brute force way of imagining doing that is to take your polishing surface and sticking it at the end of a beam and then, or an arm, and then fixing this end of the arm to a point in space and then just letting this swing around. Because as this swings around, it traces out the surface of a sphere. Okay? 
Or if you wanted to polish something flat, you just take a large flat thing, you stick it on top and you let it, you just kind of move it around and it doesn't matter where you move it because if everything's flat and it's just remaining flat. Now suppose I asked you to polish something that was parabolic. As you move around the surface, you have to change your orientation and your position to follow the shape of that parabolic surface. Okay? That requires a lot of fine tuning. Right? You can't do this in a simple way. And so, in terms of just manufacturing and polishing optical components, spherical and flat interfaces are by far the most practical, and those are, those are the ones that we most often encounter. Right? However, when you do really, really need the best imaging possible, when money is not really a concern, and you're going to throw all the money to make sure you get the best images, you work with a parabolic mirror, for example. You build it, you send it in space, you take pictures, you find out it wasn't done right, you send a team of astronauts up to fix it, and that is the story of Hubble. Okay? But we won't be working with parabolic interfaces in this class, we'll be working with spherical. So for spherical interfaces, we can analyze uh, reflection, and to do that, um, I'm going to set up what's kind of our conventional scenario for analyzing uh, both ref uh, reflective and refractive optical devices. So we start by drawing a big horizontal line, and this is what we call the optical axis of the system. And then on our optical axis, usually on the right-hand side, we symmetrically place our reflecting surface. And so we're going to use a spherical reflecting surface. So the hash marks are just the back side of the mirror. The other side is the reflective side, the shiny side. <coughs> and you know, it might be important to note the center of the circle. Maybe it's here. So this has got some characteristic radius. And now what I want to do is I want to illuminate this surface with some source of light and then ask where, if at all, do I see an image? Okay, so I could just stick a point source out here and let it shine. We've been looking at point sources a lot. But if you use just a point source of light, you kind of don't get a lot of information. You lose a lot of information in the image. For example, uh, we know that um, mirrors and lenses can, can magnify things. They can change the size. And if I take a point and I make it bigger, still a point. So if you really want to capture uh, magnification effects of lenses and mirrors, it's good to, to use something which has got some length to it. So we might draw actually a line instead of a point. Okay. Uh, but a line has a problem too because another thing we know that mirrors and lenses can do is flip things over. You can invert them. And if you invert a line, it still looks like a line. So if you want to actually capture information about the size and the orientation, then you need to use a directed line. So an arrow is sort of our minimum uh, detailed source of light that will allow us to see the magnification effects and the orientation reversal effects should they occur. Uh, conventionally, we'll just choose our source with the bottom of the arrow on the optical axis. And usually, we'll just put it pointing up. right? And we can usually move it anywhere we want, although we try and put it on the left and then we put the optical device on the right. Okay. You don't have to do this, but this is just the way we'll typically draw these pictures. Okay, so now what I want to do is uh, I want to basically allow light to come off of this source, hit the mirror, reflect, and then ask where, if at all, I see an image. Okay. So uh, what we're going to outline here is, is the method of ray tracing. And this is a uh, a nice method to kind of help you understand geometrically how the law of reflection gives you where the image is formed in a complicated scenario like this. But it's also going to be a stepping stone to doing something quantitative, deriving an equation. We'll do that in a few minutes. But to get started, um, to do ray tracing, we uh, basically are going to pick a few representative rays and then follow them, let them reflect, and see if we can figure out from them where the image is formed. So we're going to start with what I call the parallel ray. So this is one of the simple ones to uh, follow. And the parallel ray is a ray which goes parallel to the optic axis, optical axis. Okay. So that parallel ray is hitting the spherical interface. 
It's going to reflect, obeying the law of reflection, but in order to employ the law of reflection, I have to draw the normal to the surface. So I know, since this is spherical, that I just start at the center of the circle and draw a line out to the interface. And that is the normal to the surface. So now when I want to reflect and obey the law of reflection, I just make sure that my reflected beam, and that was absolutely terrible, my reflected beam comes off to the best of my ability, obeying the law of reflection. Okay. So we have our theta i and our theta r. Now, um, one beam is not really going to tell us very much. But by drawing a second beam, we will actually have a good idea of where the images form. So a second beam, and you can pick any beam that you want. I'm just picking beams that are particularly simple to analyze. A second um, beam that we might consider is uh, the, uh, the radial ray. And this is a ray which actually goes through the center of the circle itself. That is, it goes from the source through the center And what's simple about this one is when it hits the surface and I draw the normal, the angle of incidence is actually zero. So the angle of reflection is zero. It just reflects right back on itself. And now I just remember that an image is formed when I have achieved a one-to-one -one mapping. That is, when the rays coming out of the source are coming together again at some other point. Well, that's clearly here. Now, that's only the tip of this arrow. You could pick other points on this arrow and do the same procedure, but it probably would not surprise you that the result is an image formed like that. And in fact, whenever we do ray tracing, we really only have to look at what happens to the tip of the arrow. Okay. So here we go. Here's a geometric or a pictorial way of figuring out where the image is formed. You find out that it's inverted. You find out that it's on the same side of the mirror. You find out that it's maybe a little smaller in this scenario. So you're getting a lot of useful information about this. But there's also one more thing you can figure out from doing this ray tracing. And that is if you picked another line, another beam, maybe a beam that hits the center of the mirror, if you followed this beam and let it obey the law of reflection, this time the optical axis, axis itself is the normal, so reflecting off at the right angle is just doing that, what you'll find is that this beam will not cross through the same point. If you actually did this very carefully with protractors and measured your angles and used straight edges and everything, you would find that those three lines would not intersect at a point. Okay. So you end up getting this sort of neighborhood where things are coming close to each other, but they're not intersecting at a point. But what does this tell us about the image? Say it again. It's blurry. Okay. This effect is what we call spherical aberration. It is an intrinsic blurriness that arises because we are using spherical interfaces. Like I said, spherical interfaces do not give you perfect images. They have this intrinsic blurriness. Okay. You could try and address that with a parabolic interface, but a more practical way is to just make sure that when you're designing spherical interfaces, designing optical devices, that you use very large radii of curvature and you're always trying to image things which are small or far away. So you can minimize this blurriness by just choosing the different parameters in your optical configuration accordingly. But if you if you take a small radius of curvature and put something very close to it, you're gonna get a really blurry image. Yes. So like uh, funhouse mirrors, would those be a form of spherical aberration? Because they're kind of blurry whenever you look at them? So that you're getting an aberration, but it's not spherical, because I don't think funhouse mirrors typically use spherical interfaces. But, but generally, any sloppy interface that's specularly reflecting is going to give you some sort of aberration. So you're exactly right. I just wouldn't call it spherical. Okay. 
But I mean, if you look at like the, uh, you know, the safety mirrors, you know, when you want to be able to see around a corner, a car, whatever, they're kind of, you know, those are going to give you some intrinsic blurriness. But again, as long as the radius of curvature is very, very large, you can minimize the blurriness. Okay, so um, so spherical aberration aside, this is a means of analyzing what happens when light hits a curved mirror, but truthfully this is not very practical. Because if I handed you a lens and I gave you a light source and I said, where is this going to be? You'd have to, you know, set it up, measure the measure things, draw a picture to scale, do the ray tracing, figure out where the image is. You know, they're, they're like doing this by hand, it just sucks. It would, why would you do this? So, so what we would like to do uh, for this to be more practical is to take this and sort of beat it into the form of an equation where we just plug numbers in and then calculate something out. So before we can even talk about the form of the equation, let's talk about what sorts of numbers we might would like to relate with this equation. So a few things that we might uh, start by being given is um, the the radius of the spherical interface, so I'm going to say there's a distance here, measured from here, called R. We might want to say that our source, the object, is a distance from the optical device. That's something we're going to call SO. So I'm going to measure everything from this location here. This is a distance we call SO. And then our source might have some height and I'll just call that HO. O just means object. I'll use object and image instead of source. So those are the quantities that we set and then this mirror forms an image and then we can quantify the image by saying it sits at some position SI and has a height HI. So the idea here is to come up with an equation where if you're given H, O, S, O, and R, you would be able to calculate H, I, and S, I. You can do it with the picture and ray tracing, but that's just not practical. It's much easier to work with an equation. Okay, so let's see if we can beat an equation out of this scenario. So in order to get an equation out of this scenario, I'm going to label a few angles in this picture. Um, alpha. label alpha, beta, gamma. And now I'm going to remind you of a little piece of trigonometry which you might or might not have ever thought about. That is if I have a triangle and I take one of the uh, legs of the triangle and I let it overshoot, what is the relationship between those three angles? You may know. Say again? C is equal to A plus B. Exactly. A plus B equals C. The A plus B plus this angle has to equal 180. But this angle C is the supplement of that angle. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this little result to several triangles in this picture. So first of all, let me apply it to the triangle formed by alpha and theta i and beta. So we have that alpha plus theta i is equal to beta. So alpha, theta i, and beta is here. Now I'm going to apply it to um, beta, theta r, and gamma. And then one last equation that I can write down relating angles in this scenario, which does not follow from this, is the law of reflection. Now I can take these three equations and I can eliminate theta i and theta r from them. And if I do that, what I find is that alpha plus gamma, or sorry, alpha plus, uh, alpha plus, yeah, I was right, alpha plus gamma is 2 beta. Okay, that's just a little bit of substitution.
So this is awesome. I can now relate alpha, beta, and gamma. Three angles. Which doesn't say a damn thing about the distances that I wanted to relate. Okay. However, I can take this statement about angles and I can turn it into a statement about distances. And to do this, I'm going to make, make use of a concept that I like to call the fuzzy line. I'm going to draw something like roughly there. And I'm going to say that thing has a length L. And it's kind of fuzzy because I'm going to kind of orient it as I need it for various things. So if I take this line and I consider it to be part of this big triangle, then this arm of the triangle is SO. Alpha is the opening of the triangle, and then L is the side opposite alpha. Now, I'm going to take this such that this is a right triangle, so this is a right angle. Okay, that's not actually true as I've drawn it, but we'll address that in a moment. If I took that to be the, a right triangle, then I can say the tangent of alpha is L over SO. But now what I'm going to do is consider this fuzzy line to be part of this triangle, where roughly this arm of the triangle is R. So we can say the tangent of beta is L over R. So again, the opposite side has a length L. And this time, I'm going to use R as one of the legs of the triangle. And again, this is totally not accurate based on this picture I'm drawing. And that should bother you, but we'll address it in a moment. <laughs> Lastly, if I apply it to this triangle, the opening angle is gamma and the opposite side is L, and this time I have SI. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this more accurate. The way I'm going to make it more accurate is I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to drag it way the hell off to the left. As you do that, your opening angles become very, very small, and as the opening angle becomes very, very small, the other two angles of your triangle approach 90 degrees. So you can make this as accurate as you like, as accurate as you need to. And it will, in fact, satisfy these relationships. But you get something extra, because if you're making these angles very small, you don't have to think about tangent. If your angle is really small, then these are pretty much just the angles themselves. That's the small angle approximation. But that means I can take my equation for the angles and I can now write an equation in terms of distances. So alpha is L over SO, gamma is L over SI, and beta is L over R. But you'll notice there's an L in every term. No need to keep that bad boy around. And lo and behold, we have an equation relating SO, SI, and R. Now this equation is only useful if these angles are very, very small. Okay. If these angles get really wide, this equation won't give you the right answer. You could still do ray tracing. That's always going to give you the right answer. Okay. But if you're in a situation where the angles are small, this is a much easier thing to use. You can also analyze this geometry and uncover that the image height divided by the object height, the ratio of the image height to the object height, is related to the image and object distances by minus SI over SO. Okay. A little bit more work, but you can uncover that result. This ratio we call the lateral magnification of the mirror. And that should make sense. It relates the image height to the object height. So for example, if the, if the image was bigger than the object, you would have a magnification which has a magnitude that is greater than one. Greater than one. If the image was smaller, you'd have a magnitude that's less than one. 
If the image was inverted, you would have a magnification which was negative. So the magnification tells us about the relative sizes and the orientation of the object in the image. You had a question? I was just going to ask. Yeah. Okay. But the important thing is that we now have related everything we wanted to relate. If you give me HO, SO, and R, I can use SO and R in this equation to find SI. But now that I have SI, I can plug it in here, use SO and HO, and find HI. So I have a means of finding both HI and SI, the quantities that I would be my unknowns. Describing my image. Okay. Now, when we use these equations, there are situations where we might be given an SO and an R, and we find that SI in solving this equation is negative. What the hell does a negative number mean? Okay. For that matter, how do, we, how do we distinguish between a mirror that's like that and a mirror that's like that? Okay. Well, you could go back and you could do the ray tracing, and you could figure out what everything means from the ray tracing. Like if I change the concavity of the mirror, what happens to this equation? We're not going to do that. I'm just going to give you the results. But my point is, is if you're going to use these equations, you have to be ready to interpret negative signs when they appear. Okay. So the way that we interpret them is the following. I'm going to call this uh, call incident and back. Anything to the left of the mirror, I'm going to call the incident side. And anything on the right of the mirror, I'm going to call the back side. <coughs> and then our conventions are that SO, SI, and R are positive if they're on the incident side. If they are negative, then that means they're on the back side of the mirror. So if you solve this equation and get an SI which is positive, that means that the image is on the same side of the mirror as the object. If you get an image which is negative, an SI which is negative, that means that the image is back here. Normally, we would take SO to be positive. But there are situations where you would actually have a negative SO, and that's usually if you're using a compound system, where the image from the first thing is the object of the second one. Right? Now, there's two more things that I want to say about this uh, before we move on to lenses. Um, the first of them, the first, the first thing I want to say is, uh, let's take a couple of limits so consider the limit that r goes to infinity. Okay, if I take the radius to infinity. If the radius goes to infinity, then this first equation simplifies. Because if you set r to infinity, the right-hand side is just 0. And you can immediately conclude that si is equal to minus so. Because if this is 0, you just move one to the other side, and then you flip them both over. But if SI is minus SO, and I plug it into the magnification equation, I just find that M is equal to 1. So we have just used our equations for a spherical mirror to predict the behavior of what? What's an R equals infinity spherical mirror? It's flat. We just described a flat mirror. Folks, if you have a flat mirror and you stick an object in front of it, what do you see? You see the same thing on the other side of the mirror, the same distance from the mirror. And you see it upright and the same size. So we didn't lose anything by talking about spherical mirrors because you can always get the flat mirror as a limit. Now another limit that I want to consider is taking the object to infinity. Taking SO to infinity. If I take SO to infinity and I look at this equation, then I can conclude that SI is R over 2.
Now let's let's talk for a moment about how we would take the object to infinity, or what's actually going on when we take the object to infinity. So if I have my optical axis, and I have my little mirror down here, and I take my object way, way out to infinity, very far off, then if you think about it, the light coming from this object and hitting the mirror, if it's really, really far away, the rays that actually hit the mirror are traveling pretty much parallel to each other. Because if you look at a ray that's got an angular deviation, it's not going to hit the mirror. So you pretty much are thinking about light rays traveling parallel to each other. So this is what we sometimes call the paraxial limit. That is, we're considering light rays which are traveling parallel to each other. And this says that if I have my object at infinity, or if I just think about parallel light rays, then the image is at r over 2. Okay, So if I actually drew this kind of big, and then I said that's r, then these rays would pass through r over 2. Now I'm going to do something very important. I'm going to define that distance to be the focal length of the mirror. So just like image, focus and focal length, those are words that you've no doubt seen before and heard before, okay? but we have a very precise meaning when we say focal length. A lot of people when they hear focal length, they say, oh, the image is formed at the focal length. Is that true? It's true in one scenario. What scenario is that? When the object is at infinity. If the object is not at infinity, your image is formed at this value, which solves this equation. Of course, having defined the focus, we can now rewrite this equation in terms of the focus to the focal length, like that. So if you want to get, if you want to capture an image, you don't put the screen at the focal point, you put it at SI. Sometimes that is the focal point if your object is at infinity, but in general it's not. Okay. If we're going to work with the equation in this form, then we need to know how to interpret the sine of f, but that just follows the sine of all the other quantities. To um, finish up, we're going to talk about lenses. So, are there any questions about mirrors? All right, to finish up, we're going to talk about lenses. And the analysis of lenses um, is going to be more complicated, but we're not going to go through it in the same level of detail that we did with mirrors. Um, here are our mirror equations. So for lenses, we have a considerably more complicated scenario because, first of all, um, we have to work with two interfaces. We don't have to, but normally we do. Um, so we, we have our source of light sitting on the left, and then we have the light hitting an interface, maybe we call this one, but then to get back out into air, it has to hit a second interface, we call this two. Each interface is spherical, generally, so you'll have a, an R2 and an R1, but then you also have to take into account the index of refraction of this material. Maybe this is the index of refraction of air, and then that's the index of refraction for the lens. You need to know all of these quantities if you want to start doing ray tracing, because you can't tell what the angular refraction is unless you know the indices of refraction. Okay. But we could do it, you know, we could start ray tracing and then we could let this bend and bend again and, you know, do these kinds of things and work out where the image is located and then we can define the angles and we can go through an analysis very similar to what we just talked about. Now this is a compound situation, so what, what I mean by that is the way you would analyze it is you would take the light and have it hit the first interface and ask where is the image 
created by the first interface, and then use that image as the object for the light going to the second interface. So you would actually do the calculation twice. Skipping the details, if we just write down the resulting equation, we're again going to try and relate uh, the image height, the image, or sorry, the object height, the object position, let's just for the sake of argument say our image ends up over here. We've got R2, we've got R1, and then the quantities I would be interested in calculating are the image height and the image position SI. And so doing an analysis of this, which is considerably more complicated in the mirror case, we can arrive at the following equation. That 1 over SO plus 1 over SI is N lens over N air minus 1 times 1 over R1 one minus 1 over R2. For the magnification, miraculously, we actually get the same answer we got for mirrors. If HI over HO is minus SI over SO. Okay, so even though the, the first equation looks considerably nastier, at least the magnification equation turns out to be easy. Now all of these, again, if we want to work with the equations instead of drawing pictures, we have to understand the signs. What does positive and negative mean? And in this scenario, the sign conventions are a little bit different. Okay, so if SO if SO is positive, which it usually is, then I'm going to call this the incident side, and I'm going to call this the transmitted side. Okay, SO is positive on the incident side, but the R's and SI are positive if they're on the transmitted side. Okay. So it's a different set of sign conventions than what we had for mirrors. And it's not really sign conventions, it's sign results. Like you can get what a negative radius means by doing the ray tracing. Okay, and matching it to the equation. Yes. So what was the T side called again? Transmitted side. We, we normally think of a mirror as having a back, a back side and a reflective side, but a lens just, just has the side you send the light into and then the side it comes out of, so the incident is transmitted. Okay, so now I'm going to take this lens situation and take a limit. I know, we did it for mirrors, we did it for lenses. Okay. So I want to take the limit that SO goes to infinity. Again, the paraxial limit. In the paraxial limit, I can solve for SI. Okay. Complicated, but there it is. <coughs> but now I'm going to do something which is pretty sneaky. going to define that to be the focal length of the lens. Because when I do that, this equation is now identical to the equation I had for mirrors. Pretty slick. If you're going to work with the focal length, you have to have a sign convention, and that follows the same sign convention as for the radii and the image Okay, now, first of all, that might seem like laziness. Greco, is there a problem? Um, we're thinking about it. <laughs> I don't think so, no. Okay, good. Um, first of all, that might seem like laziness, because that means you only have to memorize one equation, because it's the same. 
However, there's a very, very, there's two very practical reasons why defining this to be the focal length is good. Number one, this equation for the focal length looks different than it did for mirrors, but the idea in how I define the focal length is exactly the same. The focal length is where the image is formed when the object is at infinity. That is the same definition I used in both cases, mirrors and lenses. If it gave me a different numerical result, that's fine. The idea is the same. Okay, so focal lengths are the image position when the object is at infinity. But there's another really practical reason why we should introduce the focal length. When you make a lens, when you create a lens, you choose and you fix R1 and R2. And then you pick what you're making the lens out of, say glass. So you're fixing this number. So once you've made the lens, these numbers don't change. So I could hand you a lens and say, this is a lens with an R1 of this and an R2 of this and an N lens of this. And what you would do with those numbers is plug them into this formula and calculate F and then use it in this equation. But it's much easier for me to just hand you a lens and go, this is a lens with an F of this. And you can skip that step. Okay. So when we work with lenses, we don't have R1, R2, and N lens. We just have F. Because that gets us pretty much all we need. The only thing to keep in mind is that you have to use your lens in air. <clears throat> because if you stick the lens underwater, it changes the focal length. Because you would no longer have any air. Yes? So like if one of our, if R1 and R2 were the same value, then what your light would end up doing, it, would that it, it end up going to like negative infinity, wouldn't it-ish? Because like your light would come in and then it just go out the same thing that would really happen to it. I'm just trying to like, I'm looking at that equation, like your SI equation there, and when R, one over R1 and one over R2 are the same, thing goes to zero, you get one over zero. You're right. That's a pretty boring lens. So for R1 and R2 to be the same, and for them to cancel, they have to have the same sign. Which means that they both have to be curved in the same direction. And you're right, that's not a very interesting lens. Moreover, and this is actually an interesting exercise, um, despite the fact that this equation looks somewhat complicated, you can show, and you've got to track the signs when you do it, you can show that if you flip the lens over, nothing changes. And that is not obvious, because you're switching these two interfaces, right? You could have a lens which is very asymmetric. And you might say, oh, you know, if I shine light in one side, it does one thing, but if I flip it over, it does something different. And it actually does not change the story. The focal length will remain the same. Okay. And again, to, to track that, you have to realize that when you flip a lens over, you're interchanging R1 and R2, but you're also changing the sign of each of them. Because where this curvature was negative, when you flip it over, that curvature is now positive. And similarly for the first one. Okay. But that's, that, that's a detail you can, you can poke around uh, yourself. Okay, so now we've got um, an equation for lenses and a set of sign conventions. We've got an equation for mirrors. So we're pretty much good to go. One more thing that I can say, and then I'm going to turn you over to your problem set, is uh, there's a couple of scenarios, or there's at least one scenario where we can simplify things. So for example, if we have a system of two lenses that are very close together, by the way, this equation also relies on using small angles. I didn't derive it so you couldn't see it, but this will only apply if you have small angles. So we have to use that same uh, approximation or use the same kind of configuration where we can use the lens equation. Um, and, and by the way, in this analysis, all of the distances, if I draw my lens, all of the distances are measured from the center of the lens because typically to reduce aberration, uh, we take these two interfaces to be very close together. 
So this is often called the thin lens equation because it's the only scenario where you're actually going to be able to make use of this result because you're getting a small angle approximation. So there's, there's lots of words we can tack onto this. Um, but if I have two thin lenses that are very close together, then I can replace this by a single lens with a total focal length, which is the harmonic sum of the focal lengths of the individual lenses. Okay. This scenario would be useful if you were trying to calculate the total effective focal length of a contact lens on your eye. Okay. Speaking of which, hey, let's talk about eyes for a minute. So what, how does your eye work? Your eye is this big cavity. Sitting at the front, you got this nice lens. And what that lens is going to do is take light from some source or object that you're looking at and then redirect it and in doing so hopefully form an image on the retina in the back. Okay. You have these photosensitive receptors and send signals to your brain and you see things. Okay. Now this poses an interesting question. Um, with a camera, if I have a camera with a lens in it, and I want to take a picture of an object here, then I know that the image is formed maybe there. So I move my, my, develop my photosensitive material to that location. But if I instead want to take a picture of an object there, the image location is somewhere different. Maybe it's here. So I can just adjust the location of my photosensitive material to the appropriate image location. However, your eyeball can't adjust its length. You can't just like arbitrarily move the back of your eye towards the front. So how does your eye actually allow you to focus on objects at different distances? Say again? Adjusting the lens with how thick and thin it is. Yeah, it actually adjusts the focal length of the lens. So it's, a, I mean, with cameras we very rarely it's, it's very hard to adjust the focal length of a single lens. You can actually adjust the effective focal length of a multi-lens system, which is actually more in practice what we typically do. But for a single lens, think about it. This biological system has created a lens with an adjustable focal length. So your mus the musculature in your eye squeezes this lens. It changes the radius of curvature. But from the formula I wrote down, which I conveniently erased, that affects the focal length of the lens. But that, like, that leads to the question, if your eye is not doing anything, if it's completely relaxed, what are you focusing on? Infinity, right. If you look at a very distant object, that's actually the state where your eye's musculature is completely relaxed. That's the natural state of the lens of your eye. Which is good, because to good approximation, most of the things around you are infinitely far away. Like, you're effectively infinitely far away. But as things get closer, the musculature has to work harder to get that thing in focus. And this is why, of course, you'll get headaches if you stare at things you know, up close for extended periods of time. Um, okay, one more quick word. Uh, you're going to need this for your activity set. Um, we can now that we have the notion of a focal length for lenses, we can go back and talk about ray tracing in lenses. Because if we have a lens and we know its focal length, say its focal point is there, then to do ray tracing for lenses is actually a little bit simpler than it was for mirrors because what we can do is follow a line which is parallel to the optical axis and once it hits the lens, where is it going to go? To the where the dot is. It's the definition of the focal point. Parallel lines parallel to the optical axis are sent through the focal point. Okay. To finish ray tracing for a lens, all you have to do is consider a ray going towards the center of the lens because all of the effects cancel and that thing just keeps on trucking. Okay. So ray tracing in lenses, you, you have a parallel line that passes through the focal point and then you just draw a line straight through the center of the lens. Now there is an interesting possibility. What if your focal point was on the same side? 
Well, you can go parallel to the optical axis, but you then can't go through the focal point. Because this is a lens, it doesn't reflect. So what you would do is actually bend away from the focal point. If you can't go towards the focal point, you go away from it. Okay. Go ahead and start. Now, one more piece of one more piece of verbiage that I'm going to give you, which I probably should have mentioned a little earlier, is the notion of real and virtual images. Okay. In this scenario. And don't look at the sheet. Look at me. You're going to look at the sheet. Don't look at the sheet. Put the sheets down, face down. You need to pay attention to me or you want any idea what you're doing on the sheet. In this scenario, the light that forms the image is actually passing through the image itself. Everybody see that? The light is passing through this point. This is what we call a real image. Okay? If you take a flat mirror... Where is the image of a flat mirror formed? On the back. Is there any light back here? No. Okay, all the light is reflecting off the front of this. If your image is formed where there's not actually any light that's forming it, that's called a virtual image. A practical distinction between real and virtual images is if I put a screen here, I would see a real image on the screen. If you put a screen here, if you open your medicine cabinet, stick a screen in it, close it, look at it, your face is not going to appear on that thing. It's behind the mirror. Okay? So real images you can capture on a screen. Real images you can take a picture. You can capture it on photosensitive paper. Okay? Virtual images you can't do that way. Right? A lot of people like to memorize. If it's on the same side, it's virtual. If it's on the other side, it's real. I just think of it that way. This way, if the light is actually passing through the location of the image, it's real. If it's not, it's virtual. All right, so that uh, sort of completes my barking at you. Are there any outstanding questions? Okay, so you can work in your groups on this little activity set that was handed out. Um, you should have some straight edges uh, somewhere on your table um, for the ray tracings. What we're going to do is work on these until lunch, and if we have time before lunch, we'll go over the answers. Otherwise, we'll wait till we come back from lunch, and we'll go through the answers. And then uh, for the rest of the day, you'll actually spend time assembling optical devices. Well, for that wave, as long as the size of an object is much larger than 1.31 meters, then the sound wave is geometric. But if you get down to openings or objects which are about 1.3 meters in size, then sound wave starts acting wave-like. Okay. So we can actually illustrate. We can actually illustrate this in one one single example. So if I think about this doorway, how big is this doorway? It's about a meter. Okay. Now, how big is the sound wave we talked about? 1.3 meters. So sound in this doorway should act physical. It should be wave-like. It should diffract and interfere. What about visible light in this doorway? Yeah, it should be geometric. And you'll notice that if I walk out in the hall and I yell in the, hey guys, you know what I'm doing. If I, if I stand out in the hall and I yell in, you can hear me, but you can't see me. Okay, you can hear me because the sound wave is coming in and it's very happy to turn the corner and go to your ears. Okay, but the light seeing me, it's just going straight through the doorway and continuing over there. It's not turning a corner. Okay, so light is doing what rocks do and the sound wave is not doing what rocks do. Okay, but you know, waves are waves. They all kind of do this. So, so that's the first question. What about the second question? This is the, the hard one on everybody. Yes. Um, so basically when you go through the atmosphere, as it's as the layers are more, I guess, heated, the end values, the index of refraction, are going to increase. Okay. And so it's going to refract the light at greater and greater angles until you get to a point where it's starting to reflect as opposed to only refract. And then you see a 
mirage, and then it looks like it's being a reflecting image. Yeah. So what? But why refract? Why is it reflecting? Uh, I'm assuming it's because it gets to a point where you're at or greater than your critical angle. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So let's let's actually just draw this uh, model. So there's the atmosphere as a bunch of layers, and then you know just to have a source of light. Why don't we use the greatest source of light there's ever been and will ever be? Great big tree. <laughs> Did you even consider another source of light? If you have objects, you will always and forever think of a great river tree as the greatest source of light. How many of you are going to have a great river with Christmas tree this Christmas? No, I'm just um, anyway, so yeah, so if we if we start tracking some of the light down, well, first of all, you know, if you're a big eyeball over here and you look at the tree. We, we know that the light from the tree can just go straight into your eyeball and you, you know you can take that light and form an image and you know you can see the tree. However, if we start following the light as it goes down, it starts moving through these layers of atmosphere. Now what we find, and I think Hannah alluded to this, is that if we just kind of label these layers index of refraction, then the layers' index of refractions get larger as you go closer to the ground. <clears throat> so as you go down, you're going from a low index, no, no, sorry, backwards. I've got it exactly backwards. Sorry about that. As you go down, you're going from a higher index to a lower index of refraction. But as we talked about, that means that when you refract, your refraction is away from the normal. So these beams are becoming more and more, they're refracting at a larger angle, but the refraction angle is the incident angle for your next interface. So your, inner, your, your incident angle is increasing, but eventually you hit critical because you're going from a high index to a low index. So at a certain in, and so at a certain point, you're hitting theta critical, and then you don't have a choice. You have to start reflecting. But now as the light goes up, it's going from a low index to a high index. It's bending back towards the normal. And so in the end, you can try to kind of trace out these trajectories of the light through the atmosphere like that. Okay. Now, we think about what the eye sees. If the eye looks down, then it sees these rays coming in, but these rays, the eye perceives to be coming from down here. Hence the inverted reflection of the tree. So it, it almost seems like this thing is playing the role, the, like the ground is acting like a mirror, but the light's never hitting the ground. This is an effect of the light continuously bending its trajectory through the atmosphere. But this also explains some of the things that you know from seeing. How many of you have seen a mirage, by the way? Like, yeah, you probably have even if you didn't know it. If you look at the road on a hot day, the wiggling of the road is actually a mirage. So, but you, one thing you know about these sort of pseudo-reflected images is that they're very wiggly. They're not perfect. But that's to be expected because there's a lot of fluctuations in the atmosphere here. It's thermal. It's hot. These layers are not perfectly uniform. So all of that thermal agitation is, is manifested in the image that you see. So now I have another question. Let, let's suppose for a moment that we took this scenario and we inverted it. So now let's take our layers Let's change these signs. Of course, you can look at the tree. You can always look at the tree. Take the money. You we'll always take the money. It's money. Everybody wants it. That's why they call it money. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens if we start following the light as it goes down? That's from Yeshua. Um, what happens if we start following the light as it goes down? 
So if we follow a beam down and it hits an interface, what does it do? Yeah, it bends towards the normal. So it's almost like these things just dive bomb into the ground. Mirage? Yeah, what about the light that's going up? If we start following the light that's going up, then we're going from high index to low index, which means we bend away from the normal, which means we can have the same effect. Which means that, I hear people saying it, we should see an image of the tree above the tree floating in the sky. Well, let's ask, what scenario would give rise to this? We know that a hot surface heats the air up close to the surface, much hotter than the air higher up. That hot air has a lower index of refraction than the cooler air above it. And that's why you go from a low index of refraction to a higher index of refraction. You go very good up. Here, though, the index of refraction is larger, closer to the ground than it is higher up. How could we achieve that? That happens if we chilled it. If we chilled it? Yeah, if you had a very cold surface on a very warm day where the atmosphere is warm, but things close to the surface were comparably colder, then you could get this inversion. And the answer, do you see this, is yes. So I want everybody to get up and come and stand over here where you can see this monitor. Just a little bit. And we're going to do, you want to get a good, you want to get really close to the monitor because I'm going to show you a couple of things. So really close means closer than that. Okay, uh, I don't think anybody smells too terribly. You smell worse than me. So uh, let's start with an example of what's called a superior mirage. And you can imagine this is a very cold body of water. Water is a great, uh, has a high heat capacity, so even on a hot day, a large body of water can remain very cold. So in a very cold body of water, here you have the superior mirage of this uh, tanker um, floating mysteriously in the air above the tanker itself. So if you'd like to see more examples of this, you can just Google search superior mirage. The normal mirages that we're used to seeing reflected from below are called inferior mirages, although now the reason why I have you standing there is because uh, for your ray tracings uh, in your instruction book you're going to find a website to go to and it's going to have this thing called an optics bench and you're going to use this when you get back from lunch to verify some of your ray tracings but I just want to run you through very quickly how you use this because you're going to use this um, in many activities today and in subsequent days. So what this applet is going to do for us is basically give us real-time ray tracing. And let me go over how we actually work with it. First of all, you can get quantitative results because this is coordinatized. So as you move the pointer around, you'll notice that I have a coordinate readout that changes. The origin is at the far left on the optical axis. The yellow line is the optical axis. So if you scoot all the way over there, you should get to zero, zero. Now you can take various sources of light and stick them in so I can click on the beam button and then just click on this and it'll drop a beam of light in there and then I can grab it and move it around and I can redirect it if I want. And as you, as you are manipulating an element, you'll see a lot of information about that element given to you. For example, the position uh, in this coordinate system, here you see an X and Y readout, the spacing and so forth. Um, I can stick in an object. So there's our, our favorite object, the arrow. The, if, I'm, if I've got this arrow active, you're going to see the horizontal position and then the height. The height is the distance from the vertical axis. So this is essentially the X and Y coordinates. And you can grab your arrow and you can move it around and resize it at will. It's always going to keep the bottom of it on the optical axis. If you want a point source, you can just add in a source. And then you can move that around as you like. Okay. Now the bottom is where we actually have our devices. So for example, the first button lets me drop a lens in. And when you put in a device, it's always going to symmetrically place it on the optical axis. You don't get a choice in that. You can't move it up or down. You can move it side to side. You can grab it, move it, move it left and right. And then you can grab these control points, and you can change the focal width for a lens. And you'll notice with the, when the lens is active, you're going to see the horizontal position of the lens and then the focal length. And you, know, you can switch this to the other side and make the focal length negative. 
Okay, so you can get quantitative information from these things. You can do the same with a mirror. Drop a mirror in, it's going to put it symmetric. You can grab the mirror and move it. You're going to get the X position of the mirror, and then you can take the radius of curvature of the mirror, and you can manipulate that as you like. Okay. <coughs> now, clear active is only going to delete the last thing you put on. Clear all is going to clear all. Okay. So the money, of course, comes if we put a lens in here, and then we stick an object in front of it. And then, lo and behold, you see a ray tracing. And what's nice is you can actually continuously manipulate this and see how that impacts the ray tracing. What gets even gooder <laughs> is you can do multi-lens systems where doing the ray tracing by hand would be a royal pain in the butt, but now we can manipulate this to our heart's desire. And we can use this applet to build up multi-lens systems to achieve a desired effect. If I say create a two-lens system that does this, instead of actually getting out lenses and futzing with hardware, you can do it here first, roughly figure out what you need, and then you go and build the actual device. And, you know, in playing around with this, you can make this as complicated as you want. You know, and then I, I just like to go crazy sometimes. And uh, anyway, so when, when, you, when you get back, the first thing I want you to do is go to this web address. It's in your notebook. It's the first activity. Go to this web address and build a couple of the ray tracings that you had to do on this sheet. Just build a couple of those systems in here to get familiar with it. At least one mirror and one lens system. Okay? Check your ray tracings, and then you're going to continue with uh, the actual activities for the afternoon. So my watch says 1210. Be back at 110. Okay, this room is not going to be locked, so don't leave any.